So as I mentioned to you earlier, um, there's the History of the Saints June Pioneer Trail Tour that's going to go uh, back along the trail from Salt Lake all the way back to Nauvoo. That's going to be the entire trail going in reverse direction. And uh, we're going to do that the last two weeks of June and the first week of July. There are still a few seats available on the tour that goes from Salt Lake to Nauvoo. The one from Nauvoo to Salt Lake is full, so you'd have to get on the one going reverse direction, but it won't make any difference. You're going to see all the same sites and chronology on the trail doesn't make any difference anyway, because we're covering that trail all the way from 46 to 69 different groups. So chronology won't make any difference at all there. So if you're interested, Dennis Lyman is taking care of the business aspect of that. You talk to him at historyofthesaints.org, and Dennis can help you set that up. Also, now if you want to go with me on a Fun for Less tour, I have two full fun, uh, history uh, church history tours uh, that will go all the way from Philadelphia to Nauvoo. And those two tours are available, one in May that still has seats available, a few, and one in July that has seats available. I would love to have you come. So that's, that's at funforlesstours.com. If you want to come on a full church history tour with me, that'll be one in May and another in July. Just incidentally, in case it's of any interest to you, I will be going to the British Isles, a land tour, which is my favorite, a British Isles land tour in August, and I'll be going back to Israel in October. So if you're interested in coming with me on either one of those, hey, love to have you. So the two church history tours, the British Isles and the Israel tour is available, and you can get information at funforlesstours.com. These are my favorite tours. I would love to have you come. Uh, never a dull moment, I can promise you. All right, let me check the comments one more time. Um, you know, Jamie, you just reminded me, it's been a while since I've asked you where you're listening from and how many are listening with you. I would appreciate knowing that especially on a New Year's uh, New Year's night, whether or not we're actually um, wasting time or whether we're doing any good. We'll have to see. Hold on a second. Oh, that's worse. Yeah, some of you have noticed that I shaved. I was getting tired of looking like a mountain man. I think the thing that got me was Corey Green got on and sent me a message and said, well, hello, old man. And my wife commented last night that that beard made me look like I was in my 70s. And I thought, that's enough of that. So we're back to being baby face. Almost. All right. This first story, I probably, I don't know that I've ever told this story in a setting like this before. And this is one crazy wild story. So if this offends you, don't hold it against me. But when I was a seminary teacher, I determined I would do everything I could to hold a kid's attention and get a point across. And this is one of those lessons. As some of you may know, I was converted to Christianity when I was a student in college. And um, no matter how hard I've tried, there's still some of those rough edges from my heathen upbringing. And this story is one of those. Um, I spent a number of years teaching religion in the classroom to the youth. And one day, I wanted to teach the vital importance of open your mouth and share the gospel with others when that opportunity comes. I kept thinking to myself, what if those that we are friends with, or even those that are in our family that we love, what if we meet them on the other side of the veil and they come to us and say, why didn't you tell me? That's a haunting question. Well, in an effort to convey those principles, I came to class one day with an object lesson prepared. It would prove to be one of the most difficult object lessons I ever taught. You see, in the first part of the lesson, I stood behind my lectern out in the middle of the classroom. And... Um, 
And I went on with the same old drone about missionary work and how important it is to preach the gospel and warn your friends and et cetera, and et cetera. And that lesson was going absolutely nowhere until that moment when I stepped out from behind the lectern in front of the entire class and the zipper on my pants was almost all the way down. You see where I'm going with this? Well, in three of the four classes, it went exactly the same. Some kid would notice almost immediately and then nudge his friend and it would spread through the whole class. And before long, they were all giggling and pointing and tittering and no one was listening to what I would say. I kept teaching. Even though I knew what was happening, I kept going and pretending I didn't know what was going on. And trust me, that was the hardest lesson I ever taught. Oh, that was hard. Finally, when it became obvious that the class was not going to tell me that my zipper was down, I stopped and I looked at him and I said, you're not going to tell me, are you? Tell you what, Brother Rossin? That my zipper is down? Oh, dear. And at that moment, I stuck my hands in my pockets and went zip and took the zipper all the way down. Well, the guys laughed. Some of the girls gasped and looked away. That really got their attention. And then I did the unthinkable. I undid my belt, unsnapped my pants, and dropped them to the floor. Now, don't call my bishop. I was wearing two pairs of pants. But they didn't know that. And it was awesome. Ah, that really caused an uproar. We were then able to have a real discussion about what it might be like to go through your whole life, as it were, in the presence of all of heaven and earth, figuratively speaking, with your zipper down, acting the fool, disobeying the gospel, rebelling against God, and in some cases, not knowing any better, and nobody would tell you. Well, I didn't want to have that happen. Now, the other class, however, was a different story. I stepped out from behind the lectern with that zipper down, and no sooner did I do so than one innocent young girl, probably a freshman, shot her hand up in the air to say something. I, she threw that hand up so fast, I thought she was going to dislocate something. And, and the longer I ignored her, because I wasn't ready yet, the longer I ignored her, the more violently she shook that hand. And when I wouldn't respond, she finally said, Brother Austin, your zipper's down. <laughs> okay. All right. Bless her soul. I don't remember who that girl was but I hope she hasn't changed. I hope she still has the boldness to proclaim the truth, even when it might be embarrassing. This year, this year, 2023, my dear friends, will you be that bold in proclaiming the truth and standing up for what you know is right? Second story. Now, some of you know that... Um, I'm working on a book. Actually, I'm working on two or three of them, and you can help me with it, but I'm working on a book about the handcart rescue of 1856, and what, this is one of the stories that comes from that account. Now, I'm going to have to read a lot of this to get it right, because some of it's quotes, but I'll, uh, I'll do the best I can. In the cold fall of 1856, when the Martin and Willie handcart companies and the Hunt and Hodgett wagon companies were stuck out on the plains of Wyoming without food, shelter, and clothing, calls went out in the rescue. John Riggs was one of those who answered. His company met the immigrants near Fort Bridger and assisted them on to the valley. Now, as they journeyed toward the west, it began again 
to snow. It had snowed day after day after day, just like Utah in December this year. It began to snow in Echo Canyon and dropped about three feet of snow. The train consisted of about 75 wagons struggling through deep and drifting snow and loaded to the bows with freezing immigrants. Realizing that if it was this bad down in the lowlands, what would the top of Big Mountain be like? Now, Big Mountain was the worst and most dangerous part of the entire immigrant trail. It was the spine of the Wasatch, as it were, and they had to go up and over and down into Immigration Canyon. Well, John later said of that night, he said, I went ahead on horseback, leaving the rest of the relief party behind. It was very difficult, but I managed to struggle through the snow to the top of Big Mountain. I was quite alone, but here I met two young men with six yoke of oxen who had come up on the west side of the mountain. They had come from Provo to assist the handcart company. When I told them their teams were needed at the farthest end of the train, they then said they would go back to camp and remain until the next day, end of quote. Well, John managed to persuade the men not to go back to camp, but to follow him. And together, they descended Big Mountain to the east until they met the advanced wagons of the immigrant train. John said, I realized that many of the people would perish if left on the mountain that night. My plan was to take the oxen and hitch onto the first two wagons and pull them through the snow and thus open the road and enable the whole train to pass through. My advice, he said, was followed, and we succeeded in getting the entire train over by 10 o'clock at night. The company then passed on quickly to a campground where there was plenty of firewood prepared by the men who had been left behind, end of quote. By the time John and the men finished their day's labor on Big Mountain, the cut through the snowbanks at the top of Big Mountain was between 10 and 20 feet deep. So deep, John said, you could lay a pull across the chasm and drive a wagon, a covered wagon, under it. That's a lot of snow. Well, John went on, John Riggs went on to a very useful and productive life, and yet he, was, he would always consider his service in 1856, as he said it, quote, the big feet of my life. One writer said of him, John had a tender heart for all and was known for assisting the poor and unfortunate. Perhaps it was the tragic events of John's childhood that rendered his heart so tender. When John was just a boy of five, his mother tragically passed away. He would later say, fresh in my memory is the death of my dear mother. There was a dreadfully sad scene among her poor children following her death. It was simply heartrending to hear little sister Phoebe, only two years old, cry out for her mother as if her little heart would break. We were staying at a neighbor when father came and told us the sad news. He wept most bitterly, for he realized all the sorrow of the situation. End of quote. Many years later, as a father himself, John would remember, quote, crying so hard for his mother and how a kiss from her would have softened the trials of his younger years, end of quote. You don't know this, but some of you know who John Riggs is. His full name, John Riggs Murdoch. His mother, was Julia Clapp Murdoch, who passed away in 1831, shortly after giving birth to twins. We all know the story of how those twins near Kirtland, Ohio, were taken and raised to adulthood by 
Joseph and Emma Smith, though the one little boy passed away not long after. But what of John? What happened to John, the oldest son? John became, as it were, an orphan, passed from family to family, becoming, as one writer said it, quote, anyone's boy. Perhaps that's why in 1856, after such an, a difficult upbringing, perhaps that is why his compassionate, his compassion for the unfortunate was always there and made him beloved by all. Next story. Forgive me for these personal stories if they don't work for you, but sometimes... Um, this is another one that I wanted to share. And I shared some of this on, uh, on Facebook. This last Christmas day in 2022, my family and I were in Island Park, Idaho. We all went in together and rented a large, beautiful cabin, the Marshall cabin there in Island Park. And late in the day, just before sunset, I went out for a walk in the pines. The recently fallen snow still weighted down the branches of the trees and lay several feet deep on the ground. I walked for about a mile back into the forest. The temperatures were relatively warm compared to the minus 40 that we had had just a couple of days before. Well, as I walked, strangely, my senses seemed to come alive. The snow crunched wonderfully beneath my boots, and the snow covered everything in gently rounded mounds. I saw the beautiful white wilderness before me, the upper branches of the tall conifers waving gently in a breeze that I could not feel. I had forgotten just how pristine a snowbound wilderness can actually be. There were so many captivating sights, like an old buried jack fence. I love jack fences. An old tree topped off with, a, with, a, with an odd little crown of snow right up on top, winding roads and trails going out through the trees. It was beautiful. The air was clean and fresh and sweet. It had been so long since I had breathed air so refreshing. No inversions there. But the thing that really got me, my friends, was the peace and quiet. Oh, I stopped walking several times and just listened. There was no sound. It was quiet, <laughs> excuse me, it was quiet, <laughs> calm, and peaceful, and awakened once again something I had forgotten, that reverent feeling within me that this was God's country, and God was with me, and for the moment, all was right. Once again, I had forgotten, in my busy traveling all over the world life, the peace and quiet and the heavenly presence of the wilderness. I stopped and right there in the snow, took off my hat and offered up a prayer of thanks for being reminded of something I had, Scott, I had forgotten a long time before. I walked back to the cabin reluctantly, not because I wanted to, but because it was getting dark. The peace and joy I found in the forest I have found in only one other place, the Holy Temple. Have some of us forgotten what it is like to come out of the desolate wilderness of the world into the peace and joy that I found in the forest? Well, have you forgotten what it is like to peace be still in the Lord's temple? If you have, Go back. The Lord will be there waiting for you when you get there. All right, let's take a break. 
I'm hoping that sound and visual is okay. Hang on a second. I'm going to step away here. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Wana Lu says everything looks perfect to me and sounds good. So I hope it's all right. All right. So taking a break for just a second, a couple of things I want to ask you about, if you wouldn't mind helping me. The, the first of those is I hope this comes out all right, but when Jason and I started this stories thing, our intent was to share these stories all over the world, and we would do most of that for free as a public service, and so we started these weekly subs we weekly subscriptions, I guess you would call it, where you would sign up, it wouldn't cost anything, and we would send out a free story, video, audio, and written every week to everyone on that email list. Well, that has been wildly successful. But forgive me, my goal in 2023 is I want to double that list. I want to reach as many people as I can with these wonderful stories that you're sharing with me. So would you do me this favor? Would you send this these these firesides or these weekly emails would you send them on would you refer a friend to sign up i'm going to keep asking you if you will refer a friend to these stories and help me help us reach more people there's a team of about 10 of us behind the scenes that are working and most of that work is being donated so if you would would you help us by referring more people to the weekly subscriptions so we can share more stories with more people? Number two, I need your help with this. I got to mention it once just before Christmas, and that was I'm, I want to do a new book on stories about prayer. How to pray, prayers being answered, the miracle of prayer, the comfort of prayer, and in response to that, I received numerous emails of prayer stories, so much so that I probably have enough for almost an entire book as it is, but no, I don't think so. So I'm, at, I'm putting out the request one more time. And I'm not just talking about your pioneer fathers and mothers. I'm talking about you. If you have stories about the miracle of prayer, the comfort of prayer, prayers being answered, prayers being offered, that are not too sacred, would you share them with me? You can send them either to, uh, well, you can send them to Glenn at glennrossandstories.com or support at glennrossandstories.com, and I would love to have them. I have tried to respond to every single one that I have received. So if you have one to send me, get it to me, and I would love to have it. I would be honored if you would. Now, just also to let you know, uh, we have another book coming very soon. I've worked for more than 30 years studying the New Testament. The only thing I have studied more than the life of Joseph Smith and the Restoration is the life of the Savior in the four Gospels. I've written many, many stories which share insights that I've gleaned from the Lord and from others about the Lord's life and these stories. That book, to assist you in your Sunday school this next year, is coming soon. Right now, I'm reading and editing and recording the audio book for you. I hope to get it to you just as soon as possible. But that book is coming, and I hope you'll... <laughs> I <clears throat> hope you'll consider taking a look at it. It will be useful to you in your Sunday school this studies this next year. And one last matter of housework. Um, 
a lot of the audience that listens to me, well, a lot of you are from Utah. And I would suppose that the last thing you would ever consider doing is taking a tour of your home state. But I want to share something with you. I'm going to say more about this in the future. If you've never thought about taking a one or two day trip of your own state right here, Utah, maybe Idaho, there is so much history that's right under your feet. That's all I'm going to say for now. There will be more to be shared later. All right. You doing all right? I know this is not the best backdrop, but it's the other side of the set, as it were. That's my sheepskin back there and my saddle. But it's the best I can do, considering the fact that my, my, uh, my equipment is, well, it's just like my hair. It's a mess. All right. Okay. Espinisa? She says, I have a very funny prayer story. Please send me how to get it to you. Espinisa, send it to Glenn at glennrossonstories.com. Glenn is spelled with two N's and Rosson is spelled R-A-W-S-O-N. So Glenn at glennrossonstories.com. All right. All right, here we go again. The great Christian hymn, Rock of Ages, was written by Augustus M. Toplady somewhere around 1775 or 1776. Augustus Toplady was born at Farnham, Surrey, England, November 4, 1740. His father was an officer in the Royal Marines and died shortly after Augustus's birth. By 1755, mother and son were living in Dublin where Augustus was enrolled at Trinity College, Dublin. It was in August of that same year, 1755, that Augustus's conversion to Christianity began. Now, let me explain something for the rest of it so it'll make sense. In the Church of England at that time, 1755, there were two major theological schools within the Church of England. One was called Calvinism, named after John Calvin. Now, a, this is, it's never fair to be this abbreviated, but it's all I can do. Calvinists believed, generally, that God predestined some people to be saved and others were predestined to eternal damnation. This choice by God to save some is held to be unconditional and not based on any characteristic or action on the part of the person chosen. End of quote. That was Calvinism. The other school of thought at that time was called Arminianism, which is the belief, quote, that sinners who hear the gospel have the free will to accept or reject God's offer of saving grace, and that nobody is excluded by God from the possibility of salvation except those who freely exclude themselves. End of quote. Well, Augustus M. Toplady became an avowed Calvinist, believing, emphasizing, and defending the grace of God, and he also became a bitter opponent of John Wesley and Arminianism. Now, Augustus M. Toplady wrote a hymn somewhere during the course of his work. That hymn, most of you know, it's called Rock of Ages. There that hymn, there is a commonly held tradition that Toplady was traveling through the gorge of Burrington Coombe in the Mendip Hills of England when he was caught outdoors in a thunderstorm. It is reported by tradition that he took shelter in those rocks and there received the inspiration that drew forth these words, quote, Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure, 
save from wrath and make me pure. End of quote. Well, there's a lot of controversy. The story of that storm was started some 122 years after the hymn was written. Since then, there's been a very long argument about the veracity of that story. I really don't care. What matters is not where Toplady wrote those words, but that he wrote them. It is a doctrinally profound hymn because it bears witness in the highest voice that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do, something which you and I should not forget. It is a single, singular, relevant truth that should not be overlooked, especially among us who sometimes have a misguided perspective of perfectionism. All right. We have another story here I want to share with you. I wasn't originally going to share this story, but then I realized something. We're studying the New Testament starting next Sunday, two weeks, and um, I'll just be bold. If you study the life of Christ without the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible, You are a three-legged horse in a fast race. No sooner was the Book of Mormon off of Grandin's press in Palmyra, New York, than Joseph Smith was reassigned. The project that he went to work on is little known and even less understood and appreciated, even by Joseph's own people. Yet it was so critical of a work that Joseph devoted much of his time to it, for over two years. He virtually worked on it full time. The endeavor was launched as a commandment from the Almighty himself and shepherded by him to its completion. Joseph would later call this monumental work, quote, a branch of his calling. It was known and prophesied millennia before Joseph Smith was ever born that he would do this work. Moses himself looked forward to it. It was an integral component of the restoration. So much of Joseph's revealed doctrine, so many of the great revelations of the restoration in the Doctrine and Covenants came because of this effort. The contribution of Joseph's work, this work, to the corpus of Latter-day Saint theology is incalculable, not to mention how much the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible contributed to the education and edification of Joseph Smith himself. Today, many of us hold the JST in our hands or in our little widgets here and walk off to church and we never look at it and we seldom appreciate what we have. The Joseph Smith translation of the Bible is, in my considered opinion, the most perfect, powerful Bible on earth today. As to what the JST is and its attendant power, the Lord told Joseph at the outset, when he began the work, he said, the scriptures, meaning the Bible, shall be given even as they are in mine own bosom to the salvation of mine own elect. Doctrine and Covenants 35, 20. How did it come to be? How did we get the JST? Answer, a scribe sat waiting with paper, pen, and ink. Joseph sat down, one of the places is the Newell K. Whitney store there in Kirtland in that second floor large room. 
Joseph sat down with the large family Bible he had purchased from E.B. Grandin back in New York and began to read under the influence of the Holy Ghost. As he read the Bible without the aid of Urim and Thummim, seer stones, or anything else, his mind was opened, enlarged, inspired, and expanded. As he passed through reading the text, Joseph would dictate changes. Now, sometimes in the text, there were no changes. Sometimes they were as minor as correcting punctuation, spelling, and grammar. Nothing eternally significant there. Well, sometimes it is. And other times, though, Joseph would dictate whole chapters that had been taken out of the Bible, detailing intricate narratives of doctrine and history, such as the writings of Enoch, the writings of Joseph of Egypt. Joseph would, from the fountain of his inspired and expanded mind, dictate these new passages to the scribe word for word at a pace slow enough for the scribe to write it down longhand, and this Joseph would do without ever losing his train of thought, having to start over or have it read back to him or gather up his creativity as writers do. No, the process was witnessed by many. It was miraculous. When you study the material and consider how it came to be, it is utterly astonishing how it was produced. The Joseph Smith translation is as much a miracle in its existence as the Book of Mormon, especially when you consider that it came from a 24-year-old uneducated farmer from the frontier. It is inconceivable when you know the story and you read the JST how it came to be. It is, as it were, another tangible testament of the Book of Mormon that Joseph Smith was an instrument of the Lord Jesus Christ. Many have opined that Joseph never finished the translation, the inspired version, and that or the text of the JST was adulterated by others after he died. But both ideas are false. He did finish, and the JST, as you have it, is accurate and complete. Perhaps the greatest, and this is the reason I'm telling you the story now, perhaps the greatest contribution of the JST is its witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. I witness to you, and I know, the Joseph Smith translation reveals a greater Christ, more noble, more divine, more loving, more compassionate, more of a Savior, making the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible another testament of the Lord Jesus Christ, and again, the most correct of any Bible on earth. I speak it boldly. Do with it what you will. Next story. Just Gary asks the question, and it's a legitimate question. Don't the JST footnotes catch it all? Oh, no. No, they don't. Some of the longer, deeper, sweeter passages are in the appendix at the back. And that you have to read. And, and, and even at that, the, the community of Christ holds the copyright for the JST. We don't have it, but they gave us permission to use excerpts and portions of it. But still, the, the New Testament I read is a pure, straight combination of the King James Version and the JST. Come with me to Israel and I will show you exactly what I mean. And I'll illustrate it through this next year by quoting stories of the JST about the Savior. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait to share some of these stories with you. Well, okay. I think we're down to the end. I apologize for the setting, but 
It's the best I can do, but hopefully we got through it. Um, this is the last story. And again, I wasn't going to share this one either. But this is one of the stories that came out in the Christmas book, but will also be included in the New Testament book that will soon be released. I told this one last year, but not this year. Have you ever noticed how often we tell the story of Christmas and we skip right over the birth of John the Baptist? I don't think we should. To neglect John in the Christmas story is to me like unto neglecting your preparations for Christmas until the morning of. I think you're going to miss something. Before there was John the Baptist, there was John the baby. Before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote of Jesus, John the Baptist kept a record of him first. As in his life, John pointed people to Jesus, so he did also even in his birth. Before Gabriel came to Mary, he appeared in the temple in Jerusalem to an old man named Zacharias. Fear not, Zacharias, he said, thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Luke 1, 13. The angel promised that this little boy would bring much joy to many people, but not just because he was a baby, but because he would be, quote, great in the sight of the Lord. Many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. John would do a greater work than is recorded of him in the present Bible. John would go before the Savior and, quote, make ready a people prepared for the Lord, Luke 117. Well, with that announcement, as you can imagine, Zacharias struggled to believe it. I don't blame him. His wife was an, a much older woman past the age of childbearing. Nonetheless, Mary's miraculous conception of the child would not be the first miracle baby. Before Mary went into hiding with a child she couldn't explain, Elizabeth was there first. One day, a beautiful young maiden sent by an angel came into the courtyard of Elizabeth's home and called out a greeting. Listen carefully. In the womb, John leaped for joy, and he and his mother were filled with the Holy Ghost. Can you imagine? It is, a subl it is sublime that at that moment, John bore witness of the Messiah before he even had a voice. The two sons of prophecy and their sainted mothers spent the next three months together. As John prepared the way for Jesus, so Elizabeth prepared and consoled Mary for what was ahead. Before the people heard the shepherds witness of a coming Messiah, they were astonished at the new voice and testimony of Zacharias. His prophecies resonated through the Judean hillside and, the, and through the hearts of the Jews, filling them with grand expectations. Rumors spread everywhere of miracles to come. Then and later, all who ever knew John couldn't wait to meet Jesus. On the night of the Savior's birth in Bethlehem, John was, tradition holds, three months old, living in Hebron. Knowing what Elizabeth knew of Mary and her baby and the bond they shared, I wonder how far away Elizabeth really was from her young cousin that night. You know that when Herod's soldiers came, they were looking for two babies, not one. While the angel sent Joseph and Mary to Egypt to save Jesus' life, Zacharias sent John, the baby, and Elizabeth into the wilderness. Joseph, Jesus, and Mary escaped the wrath of Herod. 
but not Zacharias. The soldiers killed him in the temple. He would not give up his son, and that was the reason why. As Jesus grew up with his father, hewing wood, so John grew up in the wilderness eating locusts and wild honey. As Jesus waited and prepared to bring men to his father, so John waited and prepared to bring men to Jesus. Luke's story of Christmas tells of a special babe whose birth pointed men to Jesus' birth. And John was born and raised up to prepare the way before him. How are you different than John? You were born and raised up. You were born to be witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ before his second coming. You were born to be witnesses of him and of his restored gospel and of prophets and apostles in this modern age. How are you different than John? Not much. My dear friends, I witness to you, it is good to be alive. And while we're alive, let's be bold and proclaim the truth with the voice that we have. God bless you, and good night. I hope you have a wonderful week.